What makes UD a special place are the faculty, among other things, and one of our longest serving faculty members is Dr. Roger Eberts. And he has a lot of influence on your education because not only might you have had him in a class, but he's responsible for much of the shape of our curriculum. And so in that way, he continues to have an influence on all of you. And he's going to introduce someone who's going to speak to us who uh, represents the generation before, the generations uh, that hopefully many of you will em emulate. So Dr. Eberts. Thank you, Mark. Um, although, if they're not particularly endeared to the curriculum, they might not be particularly endeared to me. <laughs> um, I have the pleasure of introducing a, a person who's become a good friend of mine, uh, Eric Dickman, Dr. Eric Dickman. He is uh, from Lone Tree, Iowa. Um, he, I'll let him tell uh, about some of the stuff that he did here, but I am going to talk a little bit about it. But before that, I want to just say a little bit about research. Uh, it's been interesting to listen to these presentations and see the different shapes that research can take. And um, across the university, uh, from one field to another, research is very different. Some of you may not think that we do research in a field like philosophy, but we do. Um, and I think that as I think about what research is, I, I can think of several, th well, I, here's some things that I think. Research involves asking questions. Whatever you're doing, whatever field you're doing research in, you're raising questions. And secondly, you're raising questions that are outside the box. You're thinking outside the box. You have to think in new ways, uh, suggest some hypotheses, explore some new avenues, and whatever. Um, in philosophy and the humanities, I would say that we do research by, first of all, entering into a conversation with other people have, who have thought about all kinds of things, everything, really, um, basic questions of life and so forth. Um, we enter into a conversation, and we get in deeply into that conversation, and then we begin to ask questions. Well, Eric and I uh, spent a lot of time talking about questions. Um, one of the things that we both remember is having class in, Blades, uh, in the Blades building. Uh, in the afternoon, maybe we get out, I don't know what time, at, maybe it was 3 to 5 or whatever, we would get out of class and we would walk out and we'd stand in the bell t under the bell tower talking and talking until it starts getting dark and cold and, and uh, we'd just talk and talk. Um, and Eric would come by my office and we'd talk some more and we talked a lot. Um, I remember one particular conversation, he asked me, he had an assignment, there was a paper assignment that, we had to, that I had assigned and he asked me, is it okay if I do something different? I want to write my paper as a dialogue instead of what you said. Um, thinking outside the box, see, thinking about it in a different way. Um, I said yes. Um, and by the way, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I think there's two ways to get a good grade on a paper. One is to do everything the teacher says, the instructor says. The other one is to write a really good paper. <laughs> um, Thinking outside the rubric, that's called, by the way. Um, uh, one of the things, sorry it takes so long here, uh, one of the things that Eric uh, developed an interest in is studying a philosopher by the name of Hans George Gadamer. It happens that President Bullock had uh, wrote his dissertation um, on uh, his PhD dissertation on the philosophy, um, part of the philosophy of Hans George Gadamer. And, um, our Vice President for Academic Affairs, uh, John Stewart, had also done some work with Gadamer, and Eric got to be interested in Gadamer. Well, I was trained in a whole different uh, branch of philosophy called analytic philosophy, and I thought those German philosophers were garbage. But he wanted to study Hans George Gadamer, and so um, we talked to President Bullock, and we arranged that Eric and another student, and I, and um, Dr. Bullock would meet for a seminar. Uh, and steady this book, Truth and Method, by Hans George Gadamer. And we started working through it. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, but President Bullock wasn't able to come very often. But um, uh, Brad Dodds, Eric, and I had a great time studying this. Although I, I will say that in my mind, I don't know what he remembers, but in my mind, the first part 
I just was complaining about how obscure it was and how this was just a bunch of gobbledygook. And, but by the time I was done, I really thought there was some stuff that was worth, there was some really insightful stuff in this book. Um, I'll say some, well, I'm not going to say much more about that. But out of that um, seminar, uh, Eric had interest in exploring Gadamer's thought more. And so the next year, we proposed uh, to the Ma McElroy Foundation uh, uh, doing a, the, he and I would do a research project on the relationship between the philosophy of Gadamer and another philosopher named Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, and uh, we were granted that, um, that grant and uh, um, we worked on it. And as a result of that, um, during that year, Eric uh, read papers at two undergraduate conferences and even submitted and read a paper at a conference that would, was normally uh, PhDs, so uh, it was pretty exciting to see him develop his thought and think and so forth. He went on to graduate school. If he wants to talk about that, he can. Um, Eric is currently assistant, are you assistant or associate? Assistant. assistant professor of religious studies and chair of the Department of Religious Studies at, at uh, Young Harris College in Georgia. Um, this last Sunday, um, at their award ceremony there, uh, Eric received the award for the outstanding faculty member uh, voted by the students. He also received an award for the outstanding faculty member of the year voted by the faculty. So uh, it's great that we have him to talk to us. Uh, before I leave um, and turn it over to him, I just want to say that you may think that as a student, it's a one-way relationship. That we as teachers are here to somehow impart things to you. Well, Eric changed my life. I mean, it sounds kind of dramatic, but in a very real way, reading some of the stuff from this book and thinking about it and having conversations changed the way I thought about lots of things. Um, that's what research between student and faculty are. It's, it's research together, working together, entering into conversations, and learning from each other. Um, and so I'm delighted to introduce to you my friend, Dr. Eric Dickman. Hi. Uh, let's just stand up for a second. We've been sitting for a long time. Let's see if back out. If you have to go to the restroom during my talk, just feel free to get up. You know, I won't take it personally. Uh, yeah. Just a couple things. Uh, I, I just got over a cold, so I might cough a little bit right into the mic so it hurts your ears. Um, I'll unbutton my jacket just in case. I'm not used to wearing a tie. I show up with my shirt untucked, so I try to look a little professional. We'll see. Um, okay, so I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me, the APEX committee, and uh, I want to congratulate the students who just presented all their fine work. I looked at a lot of posters out there and talked with a few people. It's great that, uh, in fact, I'm going to steal your ideas for our college. <laughs> so, um, let's see. You can read the title. So just a quick overview. What I'm going to do is briefly talk about how UD kind of shaped me into what I do today. And then I'm going to just introduce you and survey, introduce to you and survey three projects that I'm currently undertaking, one on religious diversity, another one on interpretation theory, and another on teaching. Um, so let's just first start with uh, the title. What if, what? So, so I have two basic mantras. This is the first one. And you know, it's really coincidental how I came across this. I had one of those cute Zen calendars that gave you a deep thought every day. And I'm like, oh, whoa, this is a deep thought. <laughs> but it, it's something that really affected me because I've always had this thing about thinking that questions seem a little bit more important than answers. And you know, this sounds kind of, why are we even talking about questions? Everybody talks about questions, you know. And, what I found is that although people say things like, well, the question is, I started to go, I don't know what a question is. What is a question? That's a weird thing. And that's kind of how you get captivated by an idea. You start thinking about it and you go, this is a weird thing. This is way more mysterious. Like, what is walking? Is it just catching yourself falling every time? You know? 
it's weird. Like, th things that we do are weird. So, questions. So, what is it? Someone want to read that for me? Please? This is audience participation. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> yeah, this is from John Cage. He's a, anybody know who John Cage is? Yeah, uh, look into him. He's very interesting. He has a song called 314, where a pianist gets up on stage for a concert, flips up his jacket, sits down at the piano, and puts his hands at the piano, sits there for three minutes and 14 seconds, gets up and walks away. It's a song. <laughs> Uh, now, this is from our guy, Gadamer. Um, uh, this is the quotation that kind of finally settled me into what roles do questions play. Because I want to know what language is, really, in the end, and what meaning is. Like, what's meaningful? What is the meaning of my life? Well, if meaning is actually a product of sentences, then life has no meaning because life is not a sentence. All right, so. Uh, would someone read this one for me? Someone else, not my mom. To huh. understand a question is to ask it, but to understand meaning is to understand it as an answer to a question. Yeah, yeah. So if we walk around going, what is meaning? Like, what does this work of art mean? What does my life mean? But we're not asking, you know, we're not asking the right question. We're not going to understand the meaning. Like, so questions we ask, that's fine, but then the answer to that question is what we understand. You're going to see this thing kind of inform all that other stuff that I'm like kind of going to talk about, religious diversity, interpretation, and teaching. Okay. So I'm a professor at Young Harris College, which is in the Appalachian uh, mountain range right at the north area of Georgia, and there's bears that walk on my front porch. <laughs> there weren't bears here. Uh, so I was a student, uh, I was an advisee of Roger Ebert's. I remember my first class very distinctly, it was technically called not philosophy and theology, it was called philosophy and Christianity, whatever. Uh, in that class, I remember very vibrantly, it was the first time that I ever became aware of language as language. We were sitting there talking about some idea, basically postmodernism, but if you don't know about it, it doesn't matter. Um, and suddenly, it sounded like they were just birds chirping. I just did not understand what they were saying. And I'm going, oh, that's what language is. It's like, if I, they thought they were making sense to me, but I couldn't follow anymore. It was just noise. And so then you can like track like syntax and sound rather than what does this word mean? on top of it, like you can track signs rather than understand the meaning of those signs. That was weird. It was like I was on, never mind. <laughs> uh, you know, I talk, about, I talk about altered states of consciousness with students and I say, you know, it's one thing to use a chemical like stimulant, you know, like tripping on acid or booze, whatever, <laughs> but it's another thing to get an altered state of consciousness from an idea. That's interesting. Okay, uh, anyway, my last class was on a philosophical theology too, so I'm still doing the same thing, whatever. Uh, I recently did a publication on language, and Roger and I got to do a McElroy faculty research grant on language. And, oh, Chris and I started the uh, philosophy club, a conversation group, after class at night. We would meet at the coffee shop sometime at people's houses, we would drink beer, and then we'd talk philosophy, it was cool. And now, I'm the advisor for the humanist group, Sight, they call themselves. I don't like it because it's a vision metaphor, and I think vision is too dominant in our metaphors, like, do you see what I mean? Uh, for me, I would rather, do you smell what I mean? Why is that funny? But seeing is not funny. They're both weird. Okay, uh, and then uh, I pursued a PhD in philosophy. Didn't work out, I pursued it in religious study instead eventually, but I have an advisee who's pursuing a PhD at Vanderbilt. Great. Uh, that's me and Roger. Uh, two more things. We had a great independent study. I already told you about it, so I won't even go into it. But he was very patient. He let me talk with him all the time after class for hours. And then I would come to his office hours. And so really what I think changed his life when he said that is just 
you know, I annoyed him infinitely into just, I don't like, you know, all right, whatever. All right. So, and then I want to give props to a bunch of people. These are professors that I worked with and fellow students. You can just read it. Okay, that's enough time. Three projects. I'm going to try to go a little fast, but if you can't follow, you can interrupt. I'm kind of not looking at you, if you noticed, like I can't actually see you. So you know how you're supposed to picture people naked when you give a speech? It's like I just don't look at people as I talk, you know? So if, anyway, all right. So look, we have this issue of religious diversity. Let's name as many religions as you can off the top of your head. Just shout them out. Name any, as many religions as you can. Islam, Islam Hinduism. Taoism, Buddhism, Sikh, yes, Christianity, Pastafarianism, great. Is that it? Are we done? Mormonism, sure. Yeah, Zoroastrianism. Anything else? Judaism, yes, yes, yeah. So, and, and then we can get into you know minute details of you know sex within these different traditions. Uh, we can also ask this question: What about humanism? Or we could say atheism, but technically that's a category mistake. But atheism, does that count? Sure, relative to it being a view of the world where you make certain assumptions, okay? So, so we're going to include that as part of our issue of religious diversity. And what I want to just glance at is, okay, we live under the condition of the fact that there's more than one religion, and no matter how smart you are, there's other smart people that have a different worldview than you, and if you walk around thinking they're an idiot, I'm going to call you an idiot too. Because that's just arrogance. What are you going to do to respond well to religious diversity? Thoughtfully, responsibly. Okay, so that's kind of the question here. Uh, and I want to suggest that it's about transitioning from assertions to questions. Ta-da! <laughs> and more importantly, sharing questions. And whose questions are you going to share? Theirs or yours? Okay? So this is what I'm working through. So what are our options for response to religious diversity? There's a bunch of philosophical responses which have to do with truth claims of religions. Uh, so the first response is exclusivism, meaning my religion claim, my claims are true, and you have to believe them in order to realize ultimate fulfillment. And I say ultimate fulfillment rather than salvation because not all religions believe that there's something that you need to be saved from like humanism or Zen, okay? Uh, second, inclusivism, meaning my religion is true, but it's so powerful that you don't have to believe it in order to receive its benefits. Uh, Karl Rahner called people in, uh, anonymous Christians. They're Christian, but they just don't know it, okay? That's interesting. It sounds charitable, but it's kind of saying they're too stupid to know better. Uh, and then there's pluralism. This one's interesting. People often get it wrong, but basically it's illustrated by this idea of the elephant and the blind men. So imagine that there's this elephant, there's a bunch of blind people looking around, and all of a sudden they start touching parts of it. One's touching the leg and says, it's a tree. And another one touches the tail and says, it's a rope. And another one touches the tusk and says, it's a plow. So all of them have a limited perspective, and from their perspective, fine, they have a part of the picture, but they don't have the whole elephant, so they're all right and wrong at the same time. This is kind of pluralism, saying all religions have a perspective on the one truth, which is the elephant, but since we have limited perspectives, right, your eyeballs are in the front of your head, you don't have 360 degree, you know, so you have a limited perspective, welcome to reality. Um, you don't get the whole truth. That's pluralism. So they all are limited perspectives. And, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> I told you I had a cold. I knew I was going to do that. I don't want to. All right. Uh, practical responses. Instead, what we can do is forget truth. Let's talk about use. <coughs> I'm going to embrace religion. How many of you have a dream catcher? How many of you have ever done yoga? Yeah, yeah. You start accumulating pieces of different religions and incorporating them into your lifestyle. Like how many of you celebrate Christmas with a tree? Uh, we start to accumulate different things. Now, embracers are people who say, I'm spiritual but not religious, and then, you know, do 
a bunch of different religious practices to concoct their own unique individual spirituality. So that's one practical option. We could just piece our own together, individuals. Another one is live and let live. I'll tolerate your religion. You've seen the coexistence bumper stickers? You ever seen those? Yeah, yeah, uh, coexist. Yeah, I, yeah, let's, we'll come back to that. You do your thing, I'll do mine, we're good. Last one is resisting religious diversity. Now, like exclusivists, they think that their religion is uniquely true, but resistors are interesting because what they do is they restrict their social network, like the Amish. You just don't interact with, or you can do this in urban settings, like the Hasidic Jews in New York City. Uh, you get your car from your Hasidic car dealer. You go to your Hasidic dentist. Okay? We all do this, actually. You talk with your Democratic friends. You don't talk with your Republican foes. All right? We all do this. So resist, I'm not claiming that any of these are inherently bad, because you could have a really nice exclusivist and a really mean embracer. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, all, right. all right, so there's problems. There's problems with all these. That's why I want to propose my solution. The first, the, the problem is, let me ask you a question. What year is it? What year is it? Relative to what? You see it? Birth of Jesus. Technically, you know, it's about four years off because some Gregorian monk didn't know what he was doing, but anyway, so really the end of the world happened in 1996, not 2000. Um, but what year is it for Islam? What year is it for Judaism? What year is it for Buddhism? What year is it for Hinduism? So which one's true? What year is it truly? Yeah, the current year. What, what I'm trying to say is, you, you know, okay, what direction am I facing? On my phone, I have this app called the Qibla Compass, so I know which direction to face when I pray to Mecca, which is what I do with my Muslim friends. Let's pray to Mecca. So my compass tells me what direction I am relative to Mecca, not northeast, southwest. Which direction is true? I'm facing Mecca, I'm facing south. Okay, you're starting to see the problem here. Okay, so all of these like suggest that there's one truth and that you can't, you know, your professors are really worried about things like skepticism and relativism. It's like a naughty thing to be a relativist. Don't be a relativist. There can only be one truth. Why? Why is one better than two? I don't know. All right, so I'm, I'm not saying that you, whatever. So what we find in these kind of situations are this kind of claim to rationality. Uh, so exclusivists and, and different people who argue about religious truth will often try to do something like prove that they are at least not irrational. This is Plantiga, Wolterstorff, these philosophers of religion that uh, Roger Ebert used to uh, teach to me. Uh, they'll, they'll defend themselves and their belief in Christianity by saying, well, at least I'm not irrational. And I always want to say, and? Uh, what it shows us is an alliance of logic with politics when we say something like, relativism can't be true, because if you say uh, something like, or skepticism, let's say this one. If you say something like, there is no truth, all you have to do is say, well, is that true? Gotcha. <laughs> okay? And that's cute. But skeptics keep coming back. There's something in us that go, there's something just not right with this. So despite formal logic, skepticism keeps coming back. And so what we see is an alliance of logic and politics. Uh, for instance, in, in Japan, there's this thing that in textbooks, it's called ambiguity tolerance, meaning people are open to practicing both Buddhism and Shinto and see no problem with that. Uh, in China, people practice Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism and see no problem with that. Here's the alliance of, of politics and logic. Why do we call that ambiguity tolerance and not exclusive monotheism of Islam, 
Judaism, and Christianity. Why don't we call that extreme dichotomy tolerance? Do you see the alliance of logic and politics here? I get to say they tolerate ambiguity, but we don't. We abide by, you know, the one truth, because that's what logic tells us. But if we say that, well, no, let's not call them ambiguity tolerance. Let's call them that multiple religious belonging is actually the thing to be. Then we look at exclusivists who only practice one religion, and we say they're extreme dichotomy tolerant. Are you following me? Does anybody have a question with that? All right, all right. What am I even doing? Why am I talking about this? Oh, here's another problem. So an exclusivist who says, I'm a Christian, and I believe my religion is uniquely true. You, you, know, you ever notice with exclusivists, resistors, they always think that their own religion is the true one. It would be interesting to meet somebody who says, uh, I'm an exclusivist, I'm a Buddhist, but Islam is the religion that's true. That would be interesting. <laughs> Okay, so, so what, what are religions really about? Are they about truth? I'm not convinced. It seems that religions are about transformative experiences, like being healed. Okay, so let's get over like, these claims. So instead of doing those things, let's promote interreligious dialogue instead. But even interreligious dialogue is worrisome because what we start to do is, is say things like, uh, I'm just trying to get you to ask my questions. Then I can supply you with my answer. So, so first, if we're going to do interreligious dialogue instead of apologetics, let's do uh, switching from assertions to questions. So we're back to our mantra, to understand a question is to ask it, to understand meaning is to understand it as a question, answer to a question. But let's go a little bit farther here. We don't understand other people, we understand what they say. If you treat someone as a topic of conversation, you've just objectified them, and they're no longer in dialogue with you. You listen to what they say, not you understand, like, so casually speaking, we'll say things, do you, I understand you, oh, I get you. No, I get what you're saying. Because as soon as you get them, you have now treated them as an object of understanding rather than a conversation partner. So if you go, I want to know what Buddhists believe, they are not legitimate conversations, conversation partners anymore. They are the topic of conversation. Do you see it? Uh, so the other person stands in proximity. Now, I want to go even farther and say, there's lots of things that we don't understand. We don't understand experiences. We don't understand ourselves. We don't understand... Uh, what else do I have on the list there? Others, okay. Here's, here's an example. Uh, Fackenheim, this, this Jewish theologian about the Holocaust, says something like this. Uh, we can't under like, the Holocaust, oh, yeah, I know I'm getting heavy here for a second. Okay, the Holocaust is impossible to understand, but we can formulate authentic responses to it. That's deep, that's poetic, it's great that he's encouraging this, but the Holocaust is impossible to understand not because it's horrific, but because it's not a sentence. Remember? To understand things is to understand answers to questions. Answers are sentences. Events are not sentences. People are not sentences. You see what I'm doing here? Okay. So we walk around. I'm just trying, what is the meaning of my life? I'm just trying to understand life. Life is not a sentence. You're just hurting yourself by not uh, keeping that distinction. So this, has a, this should have a liberating effect for us. So what, do, what are sentences? Subject and a predicate. And they have to answer a question. Now, this is tricky. Someone read this for me. Someone read this one for me. If someone can read it from there. The difficulty with the highly developed is that their conception of human nature is formed in such a way that they do not ask the question to which the gospel gives the answer. To them, the Christian answer is no answer because they have not asked the question to which Christianity is supposed to answer. Thanks, Tillich, for showing us how to get those guys. Because now if I can get them to ask my questions, then I can get them to be Christians. Right? 
Okay, so this is an evangelical strategy. That's not what I'm interested in in promoting interreligious dialogue. He may be interested in that. Tillich is usually my hero, and then all of a sudden he says this thing. What I want to do is understand other people. So I want to understand their questions. Uh, now, before we get there, though, uh, if we already know the answer, like Tillich here with Christianity, you can't ask a genuine question. So, like, I've, I've written papers and presented on things like, can God ask a genuine question? Take a look at Job. 68 rhetorical questions in a row. Not a good conversation partner. <laughs> can the Buddha ask a genuine question? Can Jesus ask a genuine question? Okay. Uh, so what do we have to do, really, to be able to ask someone else's question is learn their language. And what happens then is I like, have this opportunity to become other than I have been. Okay, so, so that's the first topic. Uh, I have no idea how long I'm taking. I didn't practice this, and, and I want to be done in like 30 minutes. I probably have done like 20 minutes already. Or have I done 30 already? 20? All right. We could stop here. Are we okay? Should we keep going? If you need to get up and go, just go. It's fine. Okay. Okay, so, so why do we do interreligious dialogue at all? Well, people think that, well, if I understand another religion, I can understand my own better. It'll create peace between us if we understand one another. I, I do it because it's, it it's fun. I do it for no reason. Okay. Um, I recently published this article where I like, did this experiment and said some things that I kind of regret because now it's in print with my name on it, and I don't like it. Because it's weird, not because I disagree with what I said. It's just I don't want people associating me with it. <laughs> okay, so I, I got caught up in this fascinating idea, uh, but I'll tell you about it in a second. To set it up, it's a response to this guy, Walter Storff, who claims that he wants to defend philosophically the idea that God speaks to us through the Bible. Like, I can get behind that. I think that too. But when I read his argument, I'm like, yeah, I don't think that. Uh, I think something different. So, so let's, I switched it a little bit and said, how do we get something different out of the same book? You ever read the same book twice and got something totally different? And you're like, what? You know, has anybody had that experience? Yes, okay, good. Whew. I was worried for a second. Okay, so, uh, this Wolterstorff guy, uh, look, here's what I'm going to go through quick. This idea of text, writing, speaking, can books listen, this is where, it's weird. Why would I ask that question? That's weird. And then theological implications. So, so this guy, Wolterstorff, dismisses my group, this Gadamer guy, by saying, look, Gadamer promotes this interpretation of artifacts, things. What I do when I promote interpretation of the Bible is I engage with a person, the author. Okay, so I disagree with that. Like, Gadamer and I engage with people. We don't just work on artifacts. Uh, so we got to make this distinction when we're talking about a text. There's a difference between a book, those things that sit on shelves, and a, a work. What it is that is happening when you're reading. How many of you have seen a pop-up book before? Okay, so pop-up books are just training wheels for what we do when we read a book. Like Harry Potter, right? Like you could see him in your imagination, kind of. And then you see the movie and you're like, that's not how I pictured him. <laughs> right? That's the pop-up book. We just don't need the training wheels of cardboard. There's this thing called the world of the text, and that's what a work does. It opens up this pop-up book without having to have the cardboard for us, right? The training wheels. Okay, so, but there's this person who's speaking it to you, and it's the narrative voice is what we call it in literary analysis or narratology, the narrative voice. Who is that? I want to know. Who's speaking to me when you say something like, oh, that really speaks to me, or God speaks to me through the Bible, okay? Is it God behind the book, or is it God in front of the work? 
part of the pop-up book, okay? So, uh, I'm gonna zoom through this. We don't need to talk about it. Okay, so, so I'm gonna claim that text listen. That not only is there a speaker in there, that speaker I have a dialogue with over time, and that speaker, that little gnome inside the book, the pop-up book, all right, listens to what I have to say in response and then changes what they say to me. And then I go, oh, I just got something different out of the book because of the conversation partner saying something different. That's what's weird. I don't want to be associated. I don't want to walk around saying, yeah, I published a book. I published an article where I made the claim, text listen. Books listen to me. And people are, uh, it took two years to get this published because people kept arguing with me saying, I don't buy your argument. Books don't listen. And I go, of course they don't. It's a book. They don't have ears. <laughs> And they're like, well, why are you trying to say that? I said, because I'm making a metaphor. People say, that speaks to me. You've heard people say that, right? Well, follow the metaphor all the way through. And it gets me. You've heard, you said that about artists before. Oh, they really get me. Yeah, they listen to me. They have something to say to me. We have a dialogue going on in the pop-up world. If we're gonna step back and get out of the pop-up world and we explain what happens, of course, we change our, we've learned some more information and then we operate on this artifact called a book and we get something different out of it, right? Okay, but I'm talking within the metaphor when we say that speaks to me and that's what Walter Storff was talking about, God speaks to me, not something else. Okay, so how does it speak to us? Well, we, we speak it to ourselves, you read to yourself. So you have the reader and the one read to. Theological implications. So what does this mean? Which God speaks to me? The one behind the book or the one before the work? I say the one before the work. And it has to do with things about my theology that come from a way of understanding God. Will someone read this for me? The adult, the adult's God is revealed precisely through the void of the child's heaven. The conditions of the victim in a disordered world, that is to say in a world where good does not triumph, is that of suffering. This condition reveals a God who renounces all aids to manifestation and appeals instead to the full maturity of the responsible individual. Remember, the reader responds and then the text says something different to the reader. The full responsibility of the reader is what I'm kind of talking about here. The God behind the book let go. I wrote the book, you got it now, you got to read it. And then you read that dialogue and you have this God going over here. Um, what, what am I talking about? Why would I talk about it this way? What, what I'm trying to say is we all don't believe in this white bearded guy in the sky, right? Like who believes in that God, by the way? Just a couple of us, okay, good. We've renounced the childhood understanding of God. Well, what's the mature understanding of God? Well. It may be different than what we thought it was. And there was this movement in the 1960s. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, let, let me say it differently. How many of you saw that movie, God's Not Dead? Did you hear about this movie? Did anybody see it or hear about the movie? How many people heard about the movie? Okay. I saw it. I took my uh, humanist group to it. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Uh, so this is my buddy Thomas J.J. Altizer, the founder of the Death of God theology movement in the 1960s. He was on uh, Time magazine. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, I'm not really a Death of God theologian, but because of this movie, I feel responsible to talk about it because that movie thinks that atheists and scientists like don't believe in God and science kind of. But he's a Christian who wrote a book called The Gospel of Christian Atheism. Uh, Richard Rubenstein is another Death of God theologian, Jewish rabbi, who claims that out of Isaac Luria's Kabbalistic understanding of God, that God negates himself. God dies so that you can live. We've heard that story before. So in what sense is God dead? Our old ideas of God are dead, so that we can have a vital understanding of God. And the vital understanding of God that I try to promote is this. What's God's name? What's God's name? Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah, Yahweh, my buddy Yahweh. You're my God. What's Jesus' last name? What's Jesus' last name? Yeah, yeah, Ben Joseph or 
you know, Jesus from Nazareth or Jesus Josephson is what we'd say. Not Jesus the Christ. The Christ is a predicate. God is a predicate. About a sentence. Remember, sentences are what we understand. We have a noun, Jesus, is my Christ. Christ is a predicate. So when we say the question like, does God exist? What we respond with is, you don't know how to use words. God is not a noun. Well, fine, it's a noun, but not the kind that you think it is. Okay, so that's the, that's the other stuff. Should I quit or should we keep going? One more? Can we do one more? Should we just take a quick, quick break? Stand up for a second? All right. All right, this one's about teaching. So hopefully it'll be really applicable. We'll see. So the, my most recent research has to do with uh, the classroom conversation. I call it reflexivity. Uh, it has to do with thinking about thinking. That's basically what, it's a fancy word for saying thinking about thinking. In, in education, they call it metacognition. I like reflexivity better because it sounds cute. Uh, so so let, me, let me start this way. Uh, how many of you would go to like Disneyland by yourself? Fine, maybe a few, but most of us would go with other people. And those of you who would go by yourself probably would take pictures and share that you, you know, keep, you wouldn't keep it completely secret. It's in part because we love talking about our experiences with other people. And so what we do is go with our friends and then we got on this ride and we're like driving away. Like, oh, you remember that one time we were on that ride and I totally vomited, went right in your face, that was awesome. <laughs> in that moment, what we're doing is studying it. We're, Re reliving it, re-enjoying it, analyzing it, all these things when we talk. Um, and, and I don't know how I'm transitioning into this, I'm just trying to get to this idea that uh, Aristotle defined happiness as the life of study. And when I tell students that, they always go, really, like cramming for exams, that's <laughs> happiness? No, the life of study in the sense of having a conversation that enriches your experience. That's all studying is. It's just that we've, you know, made it more efficient. Um, so, so, you know, when I think about classroom conversations, that's what we're doing. We're trying to study, have a classroom conversation about some topic. Um, so first, I'm going to try to define what, how ideal classroom conversations should go. So the ideal conversation in classroom is a game. And all games have a goal, have excellent actions, there's heroes to games, and I think there's one more feature. There's certain rules to the game. So the first thing I want to talk about, what's the, what's the goal of conversation in a classroom? Let me know what's going to be on the exam. <laughs> right? No, that's not, a, you could get that information through a lecture. You don't need a conversation for that. What's the one unique thing you could only get through conversation that you can't get through lecture or some other means? It's weird. Do we even have a word for that? Something that you can only get, so let, let's just call it something. We'll call it reaching and understanding, whatever. It's just a algebraic variable with no agenda. Uh, now there's certain virtues of dialogue too. We talked about respect, right? You don't understand other people, you understand what they say. Uh, another one is hospitableness, meaning you're going to give other people space to speak. You've been in classrooms where there's the person that dominates the conversation. It's like, dude, just chill for a little bit and let other people talk. Okay, uh, and then the last one is listening. We want to, listening is a skill. And I think this is how I kind of say that texts listen is because texts ask us questions. And questions are a way that we listen. You've, you know, when we listen to people, we always say things like, mm -hmm. like on the phone, mm-hmm, yes. You ever, like, been on the phone with somebody who doesn't make any of those sounds? You're like, did I lose you? Are you there? <laughs> we make, we listen by talking sometimes, and questions are one way that we do that. Okay, so we've got to listen. Okay, here's a different thing. Uh, games have a history, and often the history includes these heroes that kind of change the shape of the game. I always think of Michael Jordan, change the shape of basketball in the late 80s, or late 80s, to such an extent that did, not only did players try to mimic his excellent skills at uh, 
playing, they also started to imitate his idiosyncrasies, like sticking out his tongue while he shot, or putting his, his foot in a little bit when he sh So all these people started to look like him, because he was so much the hero of basketball at the time. Who is the hero of conversation? Because we all play that game. You would think that we would know who the heroes are. Can you think of one hero of conversation? You think of any other game, we have chess masters, we know who the chess, well, maybe not. Depends on if you pay attention to chess. Golf, you know some heroes of golf, right? But golf is played a lot less than conversation games are played. Why don't we know that, does, can anybody think of one? Yeah, who said that? Yeah, nice, right. Yeah, you, did you already see this? Yeah, good job. Yes, Socrates question mark. Maybe, maybe not, because when people read the Republic, they often think of Socrates as being what's called a gadfly, somebody who just tries to prove other people wrong. When I told my grandpa I was going into philosophy, he said, oh, that's where people prove to other people that what they think is wrong, right? I go, that's a double-edged sword. <laughs> no. And then I said, he's wrong. And if I say yes, <laughs> okay. So Socrates, Socrates, uh, if you read it, it sounds like he's like trying to dig into people. We have this thing now today that we call the Socratic method. And supposedly, this is a good method of teaching. It's where people interrogate you when you make a claim to make you look foolish. <laughs> That's basically what the Socratic method is. So not a good conversation partner if the Socratic method is. But when I read The Republic, I see this guy who's like a puppy that just wants to play with everything. He just hears an idea and can't help but want to talk about it all the way through to the bitter end to the point where we, we walk away even more confused than before. That's a good conversation. You've all walked away from good conversation. You're like, that was a great conversation. I felt heard. We didn't get anywhere. And <laughs> what's the point? There is no point. OK, but people ruin the game, the spoil sport. This is from when I, I'm talking about the exact same thing I was talking about when I was here as an undergrad. Sport. Think of seesaw. That's the game. Like, what's the point of seesaw? To get somewhere? <laughs> right? No, it's to reach this maximal, like, balance and flow. The flow state. You've heard of this. Or, nah, I'm going to save it. Okay, so the spoil sport is somebody who, imagine this scenario, says, let's play seesaw. You get on the seesaw with them, and then as you go up and down, they got you up in the air, and then they jump off, and then you slam to the ground. <laughs> you, you would not be fun. To play with. All right, so that's the spoil sport. They, they changed the game. I thought I was playing seesaw. Suddenly what they're doing is playing the game of I'm going to jump off quick so they slam to the ground and hurt themselves so I can laugh at them. That's a different game. We do this all the time in the classroom. Is this going to be on the exam? That's a spoil sport. You see it. Uh, they changed the game. It's basically changing the topic. So, so why do we change the game? It's in part because we're all adolescent Americans who want to tell the man, you can't tell me what to do, right? Rules, we think of all rules as keeping us down. We want to be free. That's what the Declaration of Independence is all about. Uh, but there's a difference between what's called prescriptive rules, people telling you what to do, and constitutive rules or principles that define a field by which you're actually free to play. This is the secret. Some rules set you free. Sharia law, for instance, sets my Muslim friends free to be Muslim. Without that law, you wouldn't be free to be Muslim. You see it? Without the rules of basketball, you wouldn't be free to play basketball because it wouldn't exist. So some rules, okay, so, all right, yay. So, so what the, the spoil sport is doing is doesn't want to abide by the rules and then is afraid of something, the risk, the risk of vulnerability, openness. And let me, let me tell you this, it's not about being open-minded. Because I always, when people say, oh, it's good to be open-minded, I always say, are you so open-minded that you're open to being closed-minded? If not, then you're not really open-minded. <laughs> What we mean is we're willing to take somebody else's perspective seriously to the point where I might need to admit that I'm wrong. 
or I'm limited in my perspective. Almost done, almost done. One more. Uh, so, so you've heard of being in the zone. So let's get in the zone in the classroom. And here's what I think we should do is make a distinction between two different kinds of questions. Interrogation, which one of our colleagues was researching, if you noticed the posters. Interrogative questions. Where are my car keys? They're over there. Great. What's on the exam? Got it. Done. To what I want to call, I don't know, surplus during questions. Ones that happen to you. They just occur to you. How do they occur to you? Because you're in the zone. How many of you have ever heard of being in the zone? How do you get in the zone in the classroom, right? Like in music, people are in the zone when they kind of disappear. They're not in the way. In sports, right, if somebody's in the zone, they're, they're just going with the flow. How do you get in the flow in the classroom with the conversation? I think you let go and just let those questions start to occur to you. It's, just, it's way more... <laughs> It's like I'm promoting passivity. You, you, Socrates put it this way. You follow the winds of conversation wherever they blow. All right, so that, that's it. <laughs>
So everywhere we should be asking more questions. Why did you pull me over, police officer? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So have you ever had students ask you if this will be on the test? And if so, how have you responded? I say yes. Because <laughs> I assume it, I mean I assume they're asking it genuinely. You know what I mean? But but it's just that that question is a good way to distinguish uh, content oriented questions versus interrogative, you know, informational questions that, cl that show that they're not interested in going with the flow. And, and that's okay, because I'm just responsible to provide them with the opportunity. I'm not I'm responsible to them. I'm not responsible for them. So I can, I'm giving them water if, they, if they're not interested in drinking. That's okay. You know what I mean? Or, or sometimes I take it personally and I say, get your head in the game. You know, no, I'm <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the uh, movie guy said. Yeah. But you didn't mention what you thought of it. I didn't mention what I thought of it? Right. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's more awful than I thought it was going to be. You know? Like I knew it was going to be bad, but it was. Uh, I was about to say frightening, by the way. Uh, uh, do you know Duck Dynasty? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't know them, right? Like, I haven't seen the show enough, and I thought they were parodying Duck Dynasty in the movie, but it wasn't a parody. It was a genuine affirmation of their character as, like, you know, how can you justify driving around in a truck that, like, creates all this toxic waste? And, and he goes, I've been redeemed. I'll see Jesus in heaven. And I thought they were making fun of that, but, but they weren't. <laughs> and they totally don't understand the idea of Nietzsche's madman saying God is dead and we have killed him and it's not clear that we are up to the task of living in the face of what we've done to murdering God. Um, that, that's Nietzsche's kind of call to say God is dead in the naive sense that we used to think about God. The Holocaust happened, you know? The, it's naive to think that there's this all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful God who could have saved people and didn't. That's not, let's think God well instead. You see what I mean? And so the God is not dead is like, yes, I'm a good Christian that like defended belief in God. Would you say that to burning children? You see what I mean? The, uh, Rabbi Greenberg has this uh, article, uh, Cloud of Smoke, Pillar of Fire, Pillar of Smoke, yeah, cloud of smoke, pillar of fire. And it's about the Holocaust and saying, how can we have a theodicy anymore that explains why there's evil in the world? How, how could you say that? That, you know, God lets evil happen so that we can have free will. And Greenberg's, so that's one theodicy, explanation for evil. And Greenberg has this claim that is, the test of any viable theodicy is, can you say it to burning children? And if you can't, then it's not a theodicy worth believing. Because what would you do with burning children? You would rescue them. Not say Jesus loves you. You see what I mean? Okay, I don't, I don't know why I said that. You, you prompted me from the movie. That's what it is. I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth from one minute to the next. I don't know. I was worried when they asked me. I was kind of worried, too. <laughs> Let's give Eric a hand. Yeah, yeah, thanks.